Good morning. Today is May 28th, yep. 2023 here at West Valley Grace Fellowship. And today the title of the sermon is How Shall We Then Live? Which I think was the title of a book by Francis Schaeffer years ago. Because the last few weeks we've been looking at the resurrection and what it means to us. We looked at the proof of the resurrection and we concluded last week by saying that we have to decide what we believe about it. Do we believe there's a God? Do we believe there is a resurrection? And if we do believe there is a God, then how should we live? So since we know there's a God, we know that Christ resurrected, and we know that as a result of his resurrection, that we're going to resurrect, that has implications for us. As Paul implies in Romans 1, if we know there's a God, that implies that we will answer to God one of two ways. We're either going to answer to God as a sinner or we're going to answer to God as a son. So since we're saved and we have the assurance that we're not going to have to answer for our sins because mm -hmm. Colossians 2.13 tells us that we were dead in our sins and trespasses, but now having forgiven that passive completed action, having forgiven you all trespasses. So we know that the sin question, that's that's not on the board. That's been erased. That's been done away with. But what about the account we give to God as sons? You ever had a message you didn't want to preach? Because <laughs> I don't know about others, but it, it can't come out my mouth because it goes through my heart. And, um, you know, the book of James, he talks about how the Word of God is like a mirror. And, uh, you know, sometimes you don't like what you see in the mirror. And he says, well, do you, if you see what you don't like in the mirror, do you just walk away and pretend you didn't see it? Or do you say, well, i got to change a few things. Less chocolate at night when I watch the news. Uh, the Word of God is like that. So uh, I'm preaching to you and I'm preaching to me because I preached to me first. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're going to pick up our text. Let's read verse uh, 1 through 10. This is kind of following about the resurrection. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this, in this current tent, we groan. And the older we get, the more we groan. Earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we should not be found naked. For we who are in this tent grown, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, meaning to die and be disembodied, but we want to be further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life, meaning the rapture. We look forward to the rapture more than just dying. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident, and we should be, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in his body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So we had the promise of a resurrection body because we had the end run of the spirit. So verse six, he says, we're confident, not hoping, not already hope that happens. But we're confident that while we're on earth, that's kind of an either or proposition. Obviously, if we're here, if we're not with the Lord. And that's why verse 7 says, We walk by faith, because we do not yet have our resurrection body. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So we walk by faith. We don't have our resurrection body yet, but we know we will. Get to verse 8, though. Paul talks about the other side of the coin, and he uses that word again. Confident and willing, 
rather to be absent from this body and be present with the Lord. So this is the confidence we have because we know when we die, when we leave this body, we're not floating in limbo, hoping someone prays us out of there. We are present with the Lord. So verse 9, therefore, Paul makes a reasoned, logical conclusion. Therefore, because of these assurances, whether absent, whether present in the body here on earth, or present with the Lord, we make it our aim to be well-pleasing to him. The word translated here in well-pleasing, I think in King James says we labor. This word is only used three times in the New Testament. It's used here. It's used in Romans 15, 20, where Paul says, I make it my aim. It's the same idea. I make it my aim to preach the gospel. And the other time it's used is in 1 Thessalonians 4, 11, where he says we should aspire to lead a quiet life, aspire or aim. That's our goal. So that's the idea of being ambitious in a good sense. To be ambitious of honor, to exert oneself to accomplish the thing, to use your utmost effort. So we labor, we strive, we make our best effort. You know, a lot of times with your kids, they may have not accomplished a goal or a task, and you say, well, but did you do your best? Yeah, okay, well, that's what counts. Now, if they say, you know, I just kind of dialed it in, you know, like, well, <laughs> you're going to do better next time. So our goal is to please him, or it should be. Whether present or absent, with him or still on earth in this body, our goal is to be accepted of him. Now, of course, Scripture interprets Scripture. So we know Paul's not talking about salvation. He's made it clear, Ephesians 1, 6, that we are already accepted in the beloved, just talking about our works after we're saved. Now, I know that some grace believers just break out in hives if you talk about works, but it shouldn't. So when do we please him? Well, the answer is now because it's a temp we have a temporary opportunity with eternal consequences. Uh, go to John chapter 9 and verse 4. We kind of had the same principle stated by the Lord. It says, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. In other words, why, why I can do it. The night is coming when no one can work. And over to Romans uh, 13 and verse 11 he says and do this so Paul is saying get busy right do this he didn't say just think about it knowing the time the reason we need to do it is we should be aware of what time it is it is now high time to awake out of sleep That's what your mom used to tell you, right? You're, you're sleeping in late, you're not get, get, getting up to go to school. It's high time you got out of bed. And uh, for now, our salvation is near than when we first believed. You know, I was growing up, we had the bunk beds, you know, and I, always, I had to get the top one. So if I was late getting ready for my, my mom delegated the task of me getting up to my older brother. So he discovered that when he kept saying, David, get up, David, get up, and David didn't get up, he discovered that he grabbed my foot or my ankle, pulled me out of the top bunk. Between the top bunk and the floor, I woke up. <laughs> anyway, so Romans 13, 11 is kind of like the alarm clock's been going off for some time now, so it's time to get up. So now we choose. Again, we got a choice to make. We're going to please ourselves or we're going to please God. Romans 7, turn back a few chapters. Romans 7, verse 5. For when we are in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit or works unto death. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by us, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So we're not under bondage to sin. You know why you sin? You know why I sin? I want to. At that particular moment in time, my desire for sin is greater than my desire to please God. That's all it boils down to. We have free will, and that means I can make my choice. So 
at that time I choose sin as opposed to choosing God. So it's very similar. Paul says, I make it, he says, I make this my aim. That's his goal. And there's very there's kind of similar words, a goal and an aim. So to hit a goal or a target, well, you've got to aim at it. Uh, remember the saying, aim at nothing and you'll hit it every time. Or like the snipers like to say, aim small, miss small. You need to have a small target. You need to be focused. So on the positive side, we want to please him. But like many other things, sometimes you need a little bit of accountability to make it happen, right? That's why Weight Watchers work so good, right? You want to lose weight? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to go to a meeting, and i got to show up and go, Hey, I lost five pounds. <laughs> Or I say, well, okay, weigh in. I gained five pounds. Accountability. You know, uh, something about, I know I have accountability to God. That's so far in the distance, it doesn't really affect me sometimes. But when I know how to go to a meeting and look at a person face to face, and they're going to ask me, well, what you do? You know, AA works off the same principles, right? I've been sober for, you know, how many days, whatever. So you get the guy, oh, I've been sober for, uh, you know, three years and, Five months and a guy, well, I mean, it's like 24 hours. Well, last meeting, he was sober for, you know, years, and then he comes in next month or this week, and he's less than a day. Something about accountability helps us hit the goal. That's what coaches do. So in verse 10, Paul gives his motivation. What's his motivation for having that goal? It's the fear of displeasing the Lord. Uh, St. Corinthians 2.10. No, 5.10. Are your notes correct? <laughs> so his motivation is we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So verse 9, he told us his goal to be well-pleasing. Now in verse 10, he gives us his motivation, which is aiming to please the Lord because... We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And it is without exception. All. We must all appear. It's like a subpoena. When you get a subpoena, appearing before the judge is not optional. If you don't appear, guess what? They send out the deputy with the warrant for your arrest, and you get to appear. You're going to appear one way or the other, voluntarily or involuntarily. So not only do we have to appear, we all have to appear. We all have a subpoena to appear before the Lord Sunday. Romans chapter 14 says similar thing. Romans 14 verse 10. Now the context here is the, the people have been, you know, judging people, the other Christians, based on their standard. And Paul says, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us, or is that word each, shall give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather judge this, or resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. So he's speaking to Christians here. Again, the question of judgment for sin, that's been settled. He's talking about works that are in the body and we'll all give an account. Think of it like a uh, performance review at work. You're already hired by the company. You're an employee. Likewise, you're already saved. You're already in God's family. So it's not a question of salvation of being in the company. So like a performance review is like a, it's not punitive. It's like the Venus seat. It's review of how you've done your work to see if you qualify for a reward. That's all there is to it. <coughs> now back in uh, 2 Corinthians 5.10, he says, well, that each one may receive a reward for the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now that confuses people. It's not talking about morally bad, sinful or non-sinful. It's just speak, the word bad here means worthless or no account. You know, like 
you go to the supermarket, you buy some produce, you put it in your fruit basket, and you get home, you pull out something, and you go, oh, wait, this, this fruit's bad. It's not an evil fruit. It isn't morally sin. It's just not good. So the idea is that other than the steward giving an account. Remember, we're in a dispensation of grace. Dispensation means house law. We get our word economy from it because the word dispensation is what we koinomia. You kind of just sound it out and you get economy. So we've all been appointed as stewards of dispensing God's grace. And so at the end of the age, we have a performance review. Again, it's not punitive. So we will all receive in a subpoena to appear before the judge, and this judge is without partiality. He's not biased. If you go through the Old Testament, how many times that is brought up about do not show favoritism when you judge. Don't favor the rich. Don't favor the poor. Show just and true judgment. So unlike many judges today, if you read the headlines, who are not without partiality, we know that God is without partiality. If you turn over to Corinth, uh, excuse me, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23, he says, whatever you do, so again, that's not talking about what you thought about doing. Whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Why? Verse 24, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done and there is no partiality. So again, he's talking to believers, sin's not the issue. And there's a, probably a whole other sermon right there in verse 23. Whatever you do, do it heartily. Ask the Lord. But whatever you do, again, our works in the body. Knowing. So while we're doing, we should be knowing that we will receive the reward if the work is good. You go through a performance review. If, if you've done a good job, you might get a raise. You might get a bonus. You should get some outstandings versus needs improvement on your little form there. So he's not talking about moral right and wrong. He's essentially saying the same thing he did in 2 Corinthians. There's no partiality. The Lord doesn't have favors like many bosses here in this world. You know, they got their pet who could do no wrong. And he just gets, you know, none of straight tens on his performance review. And then you've got other people who aren't the pet and they get unrecognized for the good they do. Next, our judge will be Competent Again, unlike some judges today, he will be competent, and so our review will be thorough, and it will be just. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and verse 4. Now again, he's addressing the same issue that we are about in Romans, where believers are judging each other. And... Well, let's back up to verse 2. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Again, that whole idea of a dispensation and a stewardship. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human clerk. Paul said, I could care less what you think. For I know nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this. But he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore, Judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes who will bring, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. Now some people think that this is saying where Paul says, then each one's praise will come from God. That's not saying everybody's going to get praise from God. What he's saying there is if you get praise, it'll rightly come from God, not from other men. Because in the Corinthians, they were like, they were judging, the Corinthians were judging based on outward appearance. They didn't know the motives. They were based on worldly wisdom. They're oh, that guy's doing a good job. He's going to get a lot of praise. Paul saying, if you get praise, any praise you get will come from God because only God knows your motives. Only God knows my motives. You know, in a court, going back to that analogy, there's something called discovery, where both sides have to give the other side evidence 
All they ever say, God, the prosecution gives all their evidence to the defense and vice versa. God doesn't need discovery. There's nothing for God to discover because he already knows everything. And he only not only knows the facts of the case, he also knows the motives for why we did or didn't do what we did. Which gives me so this judgment is also based on what we have done. It's not based on what we plan on doing. Again, go back to your uh, performance review example. Good intentions without action do not get you a raise. Matter of fact, it would probably get you a reprimand if you, you say, well, if the boss says, well, did you get that project done? No, but I meant to. I've been thinking a lot about it. You know, I, all I do is think about getting that project done. He goes, but you didn't get it finished. I know, but I've been thinking about it. Sorry, you don't get any points for that. So we, what actually is done is what will be judged. You can't judge a work that you didn't do. Ephesians 6, 8 says, very similar to what he said in Colossians, uh, he says, uh, doing the will of God from the heart with good will, doing service, ask the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord. Now, the same refers back to good. So if you've done whatever good you've done for the Lord, you will receive good from the Lord. It goes back to the whole system that Paul's talking about of rewards for service. And so we read about Colossians 3.23. So what we do will be judged, and if it's good, worthy of reward, then we get a reward. So how much of our doing is judged? Some people, if you go to 1 Corinthians 3, say, well, only your work for the Lord in church is what's judged. You know, did you, did you preach with a pure heart? Did you worship with a pure heart? All these things. Uh, did you teach the right things? That's included, but that's not the whole thing. 1 Corinthians 3, Paul uses the example of a building. He refers to the body of Christ as a building that's being built. And he says, verse 9, For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is, is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it. Because it will be revealed, be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Now, it's interesting wording here. Um, Paul's talking about our service and the work for the body of Christ. And so if our work on God's building, God comes in as the building inspector, and if your work passes, you'll get a reward. If he doesn't pass inspection, you suffer loss, meaning you don't get a reward. And the word here for reward is actually the word for receiving wages. So it fits that illustration that Paul is using of a contractor putting up a building and his payment is pending upon if what you built passes inspection. So the inspector comes through at the end and says, okay, this work is in accordance with the specifications we did for this job, therefore here's your pay for the work you, you did. And that's the word that's being used here. You will receive, if your work passes muster, you will receive your wages for it. However, if your work doesn't pass muster, then, sorry, I'm not paying you for that. You didn't follow the directions. It's not up to specifications. God's not going to reward you for shoddy work. Now back to uh, our text in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, 10. So we're all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So he gives the broader statement here of all things, everything done in the body. So yeah, it's true that what we do for the Lord is in a sense of service and building the body of Christ will be judged, but not just that. Everything done in the body will be judged. Again, not for sin. And this judgment is based on God's standard, not ours. 
You know, if you go to a, you know, any type of game or there's a set, st there's a, an established set of rules for how the game's got to be played. You can't just show up and oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play the game by my rules today. You know, the referee's there. He goes, well, you blow the whistle and you say you're, you're out of bounds, you're, you're not doing it right. So it's based on God's standard, not ours. So our goal, I got a reference, but it's not correct. So I guess I'll skip it. Our goal is to please him. Our motivation is fear of not pleasing him. So it should be obvious if we want to please him, we should live in such a way that is pleasing to him, right? It's kind of, you know, if you want the cake to be baked, you got to bake it in the oven. So we, we want to please him, and that means living in a way that's pleasing to him, but it kind of always comes down to, yeah, but that, that sounds great, but how do you do that? Well, first off, if you go to Romans 12, too, we had to change our mentality. Romans 12, 2 says, do not, and that's a command, we're under grace, the Paul still gave commands, do not be conformed or stop being conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we've got to change our way of thinking about things. It's not just some surface level change. The word translated transformed here, if you were to transliterate the Greek word, you would get metamorphosis. Interesting, I looked up the definition of that, and here's a secular definition, which I thought was interesting. Merriam Webster's first definition of, trans, of a metamorphosis is change of physical form, structure, or substance especially by supernatural means. So first, and that word, so we first have to, it says, transform, metamorphosize our mind by renewing your mind. And the word renew has the idea of renovation. You know, if you go in there to redo a house, you know, sometimes the house isn't too bad. You can just do a little bit of touch up, you know, a little paint here, a little bit of sheetrock there. But sometimes like our, our fleshly mind, no, we got to take this thing down to the studs and totally renovate this thing. There's no, you know, one day touch-ups here. So we got to change our mentality. We got to change what we think about things. How many often do you watch the news, read the news, and you're just their their thinking is just incorrect. We do not think like the world. But the way we do that, the way we change our mentality is by focusing on the right things. Over to Colossians chapter 3 in verse 1. If then, or since then, you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. Makes sense? It's logical. Verse 2, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for you died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who was our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And then he goes on there, and in following verse 5 and on, therefore put to death. He goes on right and talk about now, in light of that fact, here's how you should live, and here's how you should not live. So it's the same idea. You know, Paul's consistent. He says the same thing in Philippians uh, 3, 4 and 15, where he talks about reaching forward, uh, pressing toward the goal, it's all the same idea of having that forward focus of pleasing and making God our goal. And that's interesting also to me that in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul writes how he's given the example of Israel, the things they did when they were under Moses in the wilderness. And Paul says that everything that happened to Israel was for our learning. But then he says in 1 Corinthians 10, 5, an interesting statement that Paul is saying is made for our learning. In 1 Corinthians 10, 5, he says, but with most of them, God was not well pleased. Now, were Israel God's chosen people? Yeah. I don't 
I know that all of Israel was not saved. We didn't all have faith. Probably most of them did not. But it's interesting that God said, yeah, they were his chosen people, but with most of them, God wasn't happy. So is there a lesson for us? I think so. We're, are we all sons of God? Yeah. Sons and daughters of God? Yeah. We're in God's family? Yeah, no doubt. He loves us? Yeah. Is he pleased with us? Hmm. Well, let's change the subject, shall we? We know the difference. We all have we all have kids. You love your children. Does that mean you're always happy with them? You're always happy with what they do? Happy with what their choices are? Happy with how they behave? No. Unless you did a much better job than I did raising your kids. <laughs> Sometimes you just go, oh, yeah. It, if I'm not happy with something my child is doing, it doesn't affect their standing. It doesn't affect their condition as my kids. Same with us and God. Nothing, nothing can change the fact that we are in Christ, uncondemned before him as far as sin is concerned. But I, hopefully you get the idea. So, we, so in order to please God, we can't just think nice thoughts about God, right? As J. Vernon McGee says, that's where the rubber meets the road. We've got to actually do something. Change what we think. To change, we have to change what we think. Think about what we focus on before our behavior changes. So thought, well, I start to say thought precedes action. There is maybe some times where people just act about thinking. But as a principle, you know, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So we don't usually just often do something without thinking about it first. So once we've changed our thinking, then we change our behavior. Go over to Colossians 1, verse 10. Now, back up to verse uh, 9. For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. Again, that's a Filling, filling, not, you know, the coffee's coming out the top of the cup, filling, not giving you half a cup and saying it's good. We're being filled, overflowing with the knowledge of God's will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Then verse 10, there's that purpose clause, the word that. Why are we being filled up with that is that you may walk. So the reason we fill our minds with the knowledge of God and knowledge of his will and all wisdom and understanding is not to get eggheaded and brag about what we know. It is that we may walk worthy of the Lord. And if we are walking worthy of the Lord, we'll be fully pleasing to him. And we'll be fruitful in every good work and increase in the knowledge of God. Now, if you notice, there's a progression in this verse. We change our way of thinking, and that results in a change of our behavior with the result of our change behavior being that now we walk worthy of the Lord then by walking worthy we're fruitful unto every good work then by walking worthy and producing good works what happens then we increase in the experiential knowledge of God it's not just knowing about God we have an experience because we are walking that way same thing it says in Romans 12 2 where it said that you may prove, and that's to yourself, that you may prove, middle voice, what is that good and acceptable and perfect. But as we change our mind and our behavior, we prove in our, to ourselves, yeah, that really does make sense. How many times, though, when our, our flesh wants to act one way, right? Because, okay, just take a, the common example of the world says, well, you know, if you feel like it, you should do it, right? That gets you in trouble. Because you feel like doing bad things, and you shouldn't do them, and you don't feel like doing the good things that you should be doing. But what does the Word of God say? It says, well, no, you, you do do what's right, and then the feelings will get in line. So as we do those things, we come to understand that, you know, God's will does make sense. God really is you know, pretty good. So it's not theoretical knowledge. It's, you know, knowing knowledge. So when we live according to the Spirit and produce 
good fruit. Now, I remember someone drawing on the board here, you know, about Galatians producing fruit. It when we live in the Spirit, we produce fruit, and it increases our knowledge of God. We don't know, yeah, I think I know about it. So once we renovated our mind and changed our behavior, then it's going to change our focus, or it should. It'll change our focus from a worldly perspective to a heavenly perspective. Titus chapter 2, verse 13. And again, once you, once you start seeing it, you, you kind of like, you know, you never notice a certain car, can you get one, then you see them everywhere on the road. Kind of like once you start seeing Paul talking about how we're supposed to be living, you, you see it everywhere. The same thing here in Titus 2. Let's go to verse uh, 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. No one's ignorant of it. Teaching us so what does the grace of God teach us? It teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. So doctrine is supposed to have an effect on how we live. It's the same thing as that, you know, knowledge precedes action. Same thing with any skill, any sport. You have to know the basics of how to do it up here but where you can actually Put your hands on it and make it work. So here's our focus, verse 13. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So once, once we've changed our mind and we've changed our behavior, that also changes what we focus on. As the Lord said, uh, where, is your, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So we have... We switch from just looking here uh, to looking out there. And so we've got a heavenly focus. So this is what we're looking forward to, right? Our heavenly hope with him for all eternity. So without that focus, where would we be? We'd be down in the dumps, at least I would. It doesn't take much to get down in the dumps looking at this current world system. And it's on a... It's no longer on a slow road to hell. It's on the downward <laughs> and picking up speed. So what is your focus? Is your focus to please the Lord and knowing that we will give an account? Again, it's not for uh, no judgment for sin, but if you go back to the, the image of God as our Father, you know, you don't, you don't want to disappoint Him. Sure, I don't want to be angry at you, but I know it's in the Gospels, but don't we all, when we stand before the Lord that day, as he said in the Gospels, to say what? Well done, my good and faithful servant. That's what we want to hear. Let's close in prayer. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit within us that gives us the ability to say no to sin and to live in a way that pleases you both here and now, and also that we will have good things on our performance review when we stand before you in that day, that we'll be looking forward to that day, not dreading it. So we thank you for all that you've done for us. We know that's only because of your grace that we have salvation and have the ability to live in a way that's pleasing to you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.